We often hear about one in five fish being caught illegally. I must say around Africa, we consider it to probably be much higher. That's Sandy Davies. She works for an organization called FishEye Africa that is combating illegal fishing. It's a serious problem around the globe. Up to one in five of the fish taken from the seas happens illegally. It's even worse in some waters off the African coast. That's having a devastating impact on the ocean and on the livelihoods of responsible fishermen. Sandy, who is in Botswana, joins us in a few minutes. But first, we'll learn from Peter Horn about what is called IUU fishing. That's fishing that's illegal, unreported, or unregulated. Peter is on the line from London, where he works for Pew, helping with satellite monitoring of ocean waters on the lookout for illicit fishing boats. Our data point for this episode is that up to one in five fish who make it to market have been caught illegally. I mean, that's 20% of what's on the market today, and it sounds like a lot. So what's the full extent of the problem? The numbers are vast, as you say, and so sometimes it's quite hard to comprehend actually what they mean. And the last comprehensive global assessment of the scale of illegal fishing suggested that up to one in five wild-caught fish were caught through IUU fishing. And this had a global cost of up to $23.5 billion per year. I mean, if I break it down a little bit more, if you think about the quantity of fish that's coming out of the water, and that works out at around about 26 million metric tonnes taken annually, illegally, and that equates to a little over 800 kilograms of wild-caught fish every second. Now, with 90% of the world's fisheries assessed by scientists as being either fully exploited or over-exploited, there is a risk that their advice to governments will be inaccurate and the catch quotas set too high, and there'll be huge consequences for the fish stocks that are being managed. Well, let's break down what you've been telling us, which are fascinating and actually sort of pretty frightening statistics. Let's start with the health of the oceans. They are not in great shape. Maybe people are growing slowly aware that our oceans are overfished, they have pollution problems and other concerns. Uh, By removing the fish like this, you, you made the point, it's hard to manage fish stocks. So taking lots of fish out of the ocean, how does that actually translate into the environmental impact on the oceans as we know them? As the more developed fishing nations look further and further for their fish, they can wittingly or unwittingly destabilize the livelihoods of these subsistence fishermen, and that's going to have obvious ramifications for the local food, economic and societal stability and security. Now, we know about the societal impact of uh, a collapsed fishery industry, but obviously the impact is terrible not just for humans but also for the, uh, for the fish. And you also think about the target uh, species because sharks and tuna are known as apex predators. They're iconic, and it is these fish that are often targeted by IUU fishes because of their potential commercial value. But these same fish are absolutely essential for the sustainability of maritime ecosystems and the healthy ocean fish stocks. And so by targeting these species, we're having a disproportionate impact on the, uh, on, on the fishery ecosystems. This whole problem is gaining literally an international attention in the last few years. What's being done to stop it? How, how do we take this on? Well, obviously, it's a challenge. And, you know, just thinking practically, uh, we have round about 378 million square kilometres of ocean. And the average IE fishing vessel probably has a surface area of around about 200 metres square. And so it's pretty much like finding needles in a very large haystack. Or somebody once said to me, it's like finding a grain of sand in Central Park. Now, the thing is, you can find those needles, you can find that grain of sand, you've just got to know how to look, and you need to approach it systematically. And I'd say, you know, traditionally, nations have been using manned vessels and aircraft to patrol their waters, and each of these has got limitations because they can only see as far as their radars or their eyes can see, and it's very expensive. And if you don't target them correctly, it's pretty inefficient. So today, we can use technology to help us Pew Ending Illegal Fishing Project has been working on developing a system called Oversea Ocean Monitor, and this is a tool which we've developed in conjunction with the UK-based satellite applications Catapult, which is a not-for-profit agency which was set up by the British government to bring together science and ideas. And the concept behind this was, you know, so it's saying, right, how do we develop a system which can exploit this satellite technology but which can be made available to the countries who would not traditionally be able to afford or access it? It presents it to professional analysts who use cross-reference positional information, such as satellite tracking data. You may have heard of Automatic Identification System, AIS, or Vessel Monitoring Systems. And 
They cross-check that with their comprehensive databases, but it also allows us to layer information and help us make an assessment of where IUU fishing is most likely to be occurring. We can understand what the environmental data is telling us and we can look at the positional data from the vessels, which we can track anywhere in the world. What you're describing, like AIS, this automatic identification system, that's actually sort of like a, a transponder that's on uh, all fishing vessels. And that sort of lets, lets the satellite know where they are. We're, these aren't like satellites that are watching pictures of actual you know, boats on the water. These are like uh, more, almost a little bit more like what we think of radar, I guess, right? Dots on a screen. Well, it's it, <laughs> it's it's a little more complicated than that, as 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 you'd expect, because we use algorithms to look at the vessel tracks, and it then sort of makes an assessment of whether the track has the characteristics that one would expect of a fishing vessel. And by that, I mean that when it's doing some activity, say like long lining, persaining, trawling, or transshipment, it will have a certain track that it will be following over the ocean. But, of course, it would be inefficient for a human to be looking at that line. And, and what we've done is we've had the team develop machine learning algorithms which can do that. But, of course, technology in and of itself is not the silver bullet. So being able to track is only part of the equation. What I think the technology does is it helps provide the data, provide the evidence on which further questions can be asked and at that stage the prosecutions can be made and so you're part of the process and so there were some fairly famous examples in recent years of both the uh, the fishing vessel Thunder and the fishing vessel Kunlun where information has been provided but lots of different people chipping in information lots of people helping and then Interpol and the appropriate authorities making sure that they took the effective action. And now Sandy Davies. She joins us via Skype from Botswana, where she works with a number of African nations as a coordinator on Fisheye Africa. She tells us what that is and why it matters. I actually started off myself as an observer in the South Atlantic, but I came to Africa about 20 years ago to Nigeria. And initially I was working more in fisheries management, but I saw increasingly cases of however good the management was, that illegal fishing was just undermining these systems. And the communities that should be benefiting from fisheries were suffering. Um, I mean, a few examples of what changed my focus to illegal fishing was, I remember seeing the blast fishing in Tanzania. This is when, instead of fishing with nets or with hooks, bombs and uh, dynamite is thrown into the sea and it kills the fish and many sink to the bottom and are lost but others float to the surface and it's an extremely destructive fishing method and I must say today we're seeing the consequences of that uh, in the communities and the habitat. So illegal fishing, we should be clear, is operating at such a broad scope that it's affecting how we actually manage the fisheries in the world's oceans, right? I mean, the numbers are so large that as scientists and regulators try to make sure we manage what we take from the sea and make sure we're doing it in a sustainable way, that what's going on illegally is throwing off all the numbers. Yes, absolutely. And I think there's various estimates. We often hear about one in five fish being caught illegally. I must say around Africa, we consider it to probably be much higher. We consider it to be perhaps as much as half of the fish is caught illegally. And one of the problems with this, Dan, is that it's uncontrolled and it's unseen. This is why the estimates are so unclear. As many as half, that, I mean, that's an astonishing number. How do you get at that number? I think the reason why is because we've expanded the concept from illegal fishing. What we're seeing in this global trend is that the whole operation is illegal. So sometimes the, the gear will be correct, but the vessel itself is not the vessel that it says it's called. It's using a false identity. We're seeing that the documents for the vessel are, are incorrect and inaccurate. And in some extreme cases, we're seeing that there's uh, trafficking of labor and crew are being used under extremely inhumane circumstances. So when you look at all of this together, it's illegal fisheries. It's the whole element of the fisheries, not just the catching. What we're talking about here is illegal fishing that's operating on a huge industrial scale. I mean, it's wrong if someone's in a 30-foot boat and scoops up fish illegally, but where it's having real impact on people's livelihoods and on the environment is at a much greater size, right? Yes, the boats, the boats that we're dealing with here 
are very large boats, often coming from Asia or Europe. They're called distant water fishing boats. And they're coming to catch some of the uh, large pelagic species, like the tunas, or sometimes trawling on the bottom. And they scoop up, yes, 20, 50 tons of fish in a day. And they freeze this and hold it in their holds or pack it for transshipment later. Well, let's talk for a moment about the economic impact at a very local level, where local fishermen are really getting by to feed their families and feed their communities. What's the impact on them when these big industrial ships come by? Yes, it has been very destructive, and, it, and it's increasingly destructive. And one has to keep in mind that we're talking about communities that in themselves are growing. We've often got population increase in these coastal communities. But the impacts we're seeing is that as the industrial boats remove both fish and also destroy the habitats, that the local fishers, they're having to go out further to sea and often stay out at sea longer to catch the fish they need to feed the families. Um, often they're coming in without enough fish, whereas in the past they would leave perhaps very early in the morning and be in by mid-morning. They will now have to stay out at sea until well into the afternoon. And we are talking here small canoes or dows. There's a lot of problems with this. For example, the fish, the fish will often spoil. But the impact on this is not just to the fishers themselves. Uh, the way that the communities are structured is that essentially as soon as the fish touches the beach, there will be usually women running up to the canoes and the dows to buy the fish. And obviously, if there's less fish coming ashore, this is disrupting the sort of fabric of the society and the way that the women would buy this fish and then they would take it and smoke it or salt it and sell it on into the market. So we really are seeing that the demise of the fishery resources into the hands of the small scale communities is having quite a devastating impact. Um, of course, this is reducing money for education. This is reducing money for uh, any sort of local development, as well as fish for nutrition. You mentioned some progress in combating this problem. One thing that's been put in place is something called Fish Eye Africa. You work with them through your organization. So tell us what that is. Fish Eye Africa is a very exciting and new initiative, but it really is demonstrating the power of fisheries inspectors in countries working together and how by cooperating with each other they can make a difference to this. Well, there's eight countries and this is in the East Africa region and the eight countries are Somalia, Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, those are the mainland countries and then we have four islands, that is the Comoros, Seychelles, Madagascar and Mauritius. And these countries, they share the fishery and the ocean area of the Western Indian Ocean. There's a lot of actually very, very good inspectors in Africa with very limited resources. And they saw the need to be able to check information and ask about boats. Um, and that is why they formed FishEye. That's a pretty powerful example of countries coming together to solve a problem. How do they all work together on this issue? So the way it works is that each of the countries has an, it's called an exclusive economic zone. It's like a patchwork of water that, that touches with their coastline. So you have this patchwork of areas that as such are under the jurisdiction, they're under the legal mandate of each country. And before FishEye, each country, they didn't know who was fishing in the next country. They didn't know who had licensed which boats. And as I said earlier, we're talking about foreign boats here, about 500 fishing boats that come to fish in this region. And they're often chasing the same fishery resource around in between these different EEZs or zones of the countries. So what the fisheries inspectors do now is they, via, via communications tools on the internet and sometimes traditional telephones, they share lists of who they've licensed, of who they've inspected, and cross-check information. So they, they look at where the boats say they are and follow them together. And 
they've turned up some incredibly interesting facts. And I must say, these countries, in the last four or five years, they've worked on more than 35 individual cases. Um, many of those cases involve many boats. This was not possible before. You signal some of the potential bad behavior in that. There have been stories about these rogue ships actually painting new names on the backs of their vessels right out at sea. I mean, changing their identities and trying to slip into new places. Yeah, these these methods um, have become very obvious now. And this is actually what Fisheye has seen. The vessels have copies of various certificates, various registrations or licenses, fishing licenses. And they do exactly that. They just paint a new name on the boat. And this planned and systematic illegality has been the big eye-opener uh, for, for the countries. And we see now that we must, we must tackle this in a different way. So what happens next? Is the idea that you try to make it so difficult for these illegal fishers that they just give up and go away? What's the strategy for the end game? The strategy is that the, the bad operators will leave or they will, they will stop operating illegally and operate legally. A good example of that is a case for a persona called the Premier. This was a South Korean persona that was actually illegally fishing in West Africa. And it was fined and he didn't want to pay the fine. So it moved into the Indian Ocean, which is in East Africa. And because of the Fisheye Task Force, the inspectors were watching this boat and they were monitoring it with satellite monitoring. And when it approached Kenya to try to get a license to fish, Kenya was able to check their documents and their certificates and actually even a letter saying that they had paid their fines in Liberia and see that these were all forgeries. So what happened then was all of the fisheye countries, they refused to let the vessel come in to their ports to offload the catch, and they also refused to let it continue to fish in their waters. So this vessel eventually had to leave and go back to Asia and offload its catch elsewhere, which was really an incredibly united action. A success story. The fight against illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing is going to require many more success stories before we can declare victory. If you're wondering what you can do, here's a final thought from Peter Horn. But I think that for the listeners, it's just taking a little bit of interest in the food that we actually get on our plate. And it's very common these days, certainly in the UK, to understand the provenance of your meat and your vegetables. And I think we can do the same for our fish because the systems and the technology and the desire is there for the suppliers to actually give us more information. And we just need to help prompt them to demand that and expect a little bit more leadership and a little bit more political will. We can do something about it. We just need to take a little bit of interest in it. Thanks for joining us. Pew also published an interactive video that shows how governments and organizations around the globe are working to tackle the problem of illegal fishing. You can find it along with more resources at pewtrust.org slash endillegalfishing. Remember, we're all about the data here, so give us some of our own. Provide a review at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. For the Pew Charitable Trusts, I'm Dan LaDuke, and this is After the Fact.